Hello and welcome to Fintech Impact. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. A little piece of housekeeping before we get started. As I've been telling you all lately, please uh, take the time to sign up for my website at jasonpereira.ca where you will be notified of all future podcasts, television, posts, interviews, you name it. So on today's show, today on the show I have Zach Brown, VP of Sales for Dialog. Dialog is a telehealth service that enables you to access healthcare right from your smartphone in convenient and fast and user-friendly way. And with that, here's my interview with Zach. Hello, Zach. How are you doing, Jason? Thanks for taking the time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, you know, you're you're rounding out. You're the last person on the panel of the IPC uh, conference I, that I posted that I had yet to interview. That's just not true. I still haven't interviewed Adam, but the last uh, the last fintech guy that I uh, haven't interviewed. So, thought I'd bring you on the show. So, Zach Brown of Dialogue, tell us about Dialogue. Yeah, absolutely. So, we are a, a virtual healthcare company. We are headquartered in in Montreal with operations all across Canada as well as in, as in Germany. For those of you not familiar with virtual healthcare, effectively what a virtual healthcare service, and in this case, Dialog allows you to do is connect with a healthcare practitioner within minutes from a smartphone or any web, uh, web-enabled device, 24-7, 365. We're a little bit unique at a high level in that we're focused exclusively on the employer market. So there are other providers in the space doing sort of, you know, Direct to consumer B two C services where they're selling one off doctor consults and and, and everything mm-hmm. like that. Whereas we're focused exclusively on working with business leaders, HR leaders, and, and effectively large groups to provide services at scale and to add value to the user, the patient, as well as the the payer, the uh, in this case the organizations that that trust Dialog to look after the health, wellness, well being of their employees and their family. Good. So we're going to dive into that. So tell me about the origin of Dialog and how it came to be. Sure. So the, the company was founded in the spring of 2016. And we were fortunate to, to have been funded and backed both you know, strategically and financially early on uh, through um, Powers Venture Arm. So through Portage and, and more specifically Diagram. Diagram is the, let's call it venture launch pad that is uh, funded through the, the Power ecosystem. So through a, no, a, a network of angels, as well as through Power Financial uh, IGM, other LPs that are that were involved in Portage. So their model is a little, is unique in that rather than make many, 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 many small bets, their approach is such that they'll kind of let's say over quote unquote capitalize and seed a smaller number of companies. Over capitalize, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right off. In in in, in, in uh, blessing and a curse at the same time. Yeah, in in hopes of like placing fewer bigger bets. Yeah. Um, and not only equipping companies like Dialog with capital, but also with expertise and access to the network that their investor network brings. So, for example, yeah, Paul's been on the show before, and, and you know it's it's a smart play. I mean, for those basically go back and listen to the Paul Demaray interview, and it was basically the they're tied into the entire power financial ecosystem. Which, for those of you who aren't unaware of it, IGM and Canada Life and more companies that can count because every time I look at the, the chart, there is someone else on the chart. So they have a very very deep knowledge and ecosystem of traditional finance players. So this is their little disruptor. And so, yeah, I think they, besides offering money and the expertise most, uh, most VCs can offer, they offer access to a traditional network that no one else can. So yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. And, and operationally, you know, for, for us, it was interesting because, you know, when you're starting a company and you're five, 10 employees, like you might not need a, a full-time CFO, you might not need a mm-hmm. full-time VPHR, you might not need all these, all these folks. And they've got centralized resources at, as part of Diagram sort of a venture launch pad incubator offer that effectively allows you to have access to these resources as part of the core service that they offer. So they're placing those fewer, larger bets, but also kind of ensuring those bets by pairing you with like resources to help you be successful early on. So you can focus more on selling, building a product, building a service rather than back office admin, running payroll and things like that. So basically you said you guys are different than others and that you're predominantly focused on the employer market. Tell me about how you work with the employer market to offer your services. Sure. Actually, you know what? before we do that, let's take a step back. Tell me about what the experience is with the app in the first place. So I, I get access to this one way or another. I get the app. And what is it that I can expect to use it for? Or what are the different use cases? Yeah. So the service is available, you know, through a smartphone, through a tablet, through a computer, whatever the case may be. And effectively, you're able to connect with a practitioner within minutes. 
So typically you would open the app, you'd select the nature of the ailment. Let's say it's a dermatology issue, a mental health related issue, uh, your throat hurts, you know, you need a prescription, whatever the case may be. You're able to do a short, you know, intake process. So we've actually got an AI powered triage that allows you to kind of describe your ailments in, in a couple of minutes. And effectively what that does is that Following that, you're connected with a healthcare practitioner, and that healthcare practitioner has great context as to why you're coming on the platform here today. So following the consult with the practitioner, whether it's on video or text or, or over the telephone, um, there's a few outcomes. You could get a prescription. You could get a lab requisition if needed. You could get a referral to a specialist. And what I've described so far, like kind of getting access to a practitioner quickly is what, what we call like a pretty typical virtual care experience. So most of the providers in Canada and globally really are providing these types of services services. But what we've tried to do is go a little bit beyond providing these these great services, but also like taking things one step further. So providing like concierge services, providing like navigation through like the complex healthcare system. So good example is maybe a year, I guess it was two years ago now, I was going to Costa Rica. Okay. So I come on, I come into the office. I'm excited for my trip. My colleagues are like, uh, you get vaccinated. Yeah. yeah. So, so I said, uh, do I need to? And I look around and I'm talking to like the salespeople. So I'm like, I respect them for many reasons, but their medical expertise is not necessarily one of those reasons. So I go on dialogue. I, I talk to a doctor within, within a few minutes. He says, you know, based on the region, within the region you're going to in the time of year, like it's not required, but it's advised. Okay. So he gives me the, the requisition for the, for the travel clinic. And then where do I go from here? Okay. Well, so in, in the case of dialogue, this is where we're really unique, like a care coordinator effectively a care concierge comes on the platform and says, okay, Zach, I see there's a travel clinic like a few minutes from your office. They've got an appointment at 1 p.m. Like, do you want to go there? Okay, I see there's one near your house. So like, it's really about like taking it and closing the loop and providing that continuity. And, and the, the other thing that we do that's really unique is like following the interactions, like you actually get a follow-up from practitioners. So I think back to back in early 2017, when I, when I was interviewing for the job at Dialogue, the virtual healthcare space was really, really immature. I had very little exposure to this type of service. In fact, I had never heard of it. So when I'm interviewing, I'm thinking, okay, I'd like to get access to the platform. So uh, Sharif, our, our CEO co-founder, he, he gave me access. And it was one of those cases where, you know, I hope I get a chance to use it, but maybe not because that means I'm perhaps uh, sick, right? So <laughs> I, I went to go get my kid who was, um, he was three at the time. Uh, I went to pick him up at daycare. He tripped, fell, oh, hit his head. Forget that then. He's going to be sick every other week. Yeah, yeah. There's no shortage of reasons. So he, he trips, hits his face. And he's got a big welt like within yeah. seconds between his eyes. Okay, so I'm like, all right, I console him. I get on the, the platform. I say, now's my chance, right? So I'm able to connect with with a practitioner in, in, a, in a couple of minutes. In this case, she had assured me everything was okay. Check his pupils, symptoms, whatever. So again, that's what I'd call like a fairly typical virtual healthcare experience, which is getting connected to a practitioner in minutes. Cool. But the thing that was really, really, really impactful was the next day at around 10 a.m., I got a message from a nurse saying, how's Henry doing? And like for me, I'm just like, it was like unlike any other healthcare experience I'd ever I'd ever had. And it's not because, you know, we're really fortunate to live in a country where we have universal access to care. And it's not because the nurse that followed up with me, like, is the same nurse that works at the, you know, the hospitals here in the in the city. But it's just yep. it's just they're, they're enabled by technology and by process. And so really these are some of the things that we do to build on that typical virtual care experience. And ultimately, like because we work with, you know, employers and you know, we're really focused on, yeah, like providing a great experience and delighting patients, but also like outcomes for organizations. So like the National Bank is offering our services for, as one example to their you know 20,000 employees. And the reason that they're paying for a service like this, like they want to keep obviously their people happy, healthy, productive, performing at their best, but like not having a doctor's appointment so they can avoid it. Yeah. There's a talent acquisition and retention angle for sure. Like this shows the bank cares about their people. And, and I was thinking also, more from the keeping them working, right? If yeah, you absolutely. There's the office also for a doctor's appointment to check in on stuff. They are more productive. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, the other big reason why employers are paying for this type of service is to reduce absenteeism. So yeah. what we found is that on average, like we, we actually survey users after they use the service. So rather than us form a hypothesis, we ask users, like, how much time did you save today using Dialog? And on average, users report saving more than four hours per interaction. So for us, like approach is to work really, really closely with the HR leaders within the company to promote the service, to make sure the reach is wide, to make sure that users know about it, that they're using it because every interaction puts, you know, kind of four plus hours back in the pocket of the organization. And 
it's not about keeping people chained to their desk. It's about like well, in the early the days, time. like travel, transportation, sitting there in a waiting room. Like it doesn't matter if it's the easiest book to be in drop in clinic. I got to get off my butt <laughs> to go, get, yeah, to go yeah. get, you know, a simple symptom checked out. That is a big investment in time beyond the time I'm talking to the doctor. Yeah, for sure. And, 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 you know, especially in the early days of virtual care, we used to hear like, let's say like one of the cynical objections we'd hear from HR leaders was like, the employee's going to, I understand that you're going to save time, but that employee is going to make up the work in the evening anyway. And my argument to that is exactly, exactly. Yeah, so like so you your, your employees to, to should like be spending time experience. with their family. Exactly. Yeah. You know, so for me, like I'm busy. I'm not looking for reason to take time off work. I've got a young yeah. child that I want to be spending time with. So it's like, yeah, if I take a half day off to deal with something, go wait in the doctor for a three minute interaction with the practitioner, then I, yeah, you're right. I'm gonna have to work the night and I'm going to be resentful. Yeah. You know? yeah so this yeah, is kind yeah, of what we're seeing more and more. It's one of those things where if I was in those meetings, I would have been less than kind. I'm like, really? <laughs> That's yeah. And then, and then I'll take the, the less cynical view of, okay, but then they have their evenings to work on other stuff as opposed to whatever. <laughs> so there's more productivity. Absolutely. So I don't know. Yeah. So let's go back to that question I asked earlier about the employer market. Tell me about your focus there, why you focus there and how that's working out for you. Yeah. So for us, like it's, it's really like the employer market represents like what I call like a one to many relationship. So where we can work with, with one or, you know, a, a committee of folks, like let's call it the leadership within the company, but get access to, you know, hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of employees. And so for us, it was really about kind of framing the narrative around how we can add, access, add value to the user, the patient. Like, obviously, we just talked about that, how we can save people time, but also add value to the business. So when we first started, I recall very clearly, like, asking our uh, Sharif, our, our CEO, when I was kind of interviewing back in their spring of 17, like, you know, who are the types of employers that are coming on board with this? And at that time, he said, you know, our ideal customer profile would be, you know, companies of 50 to 500 tech companies and kind of professional services. Those were the the, the really early adopters at the time where the where the business case was like so. Well, that makes obvious. sense, right? Like they they want everything to be digital tech companies. Wow. Tech companies want a tech solution for everything. Shocking. Yeah. Yeah. And absolutely. And then the, the, the partner at a consulting company can save 10 minutes a year and this thing pays for itself many, many times over. Right. So. At first, we were dealing with companies of, you know, dozens and hundreds of employees, typically. What we found over the years, and it's really, really exciting, is, you know, we're seeing, obviously, broader adoption among companies of all sizes. So we have now several groups of, with tens of thousands of employees that are offering our services. And not only have we seen the size and the regional distribution kind of widen, so we're serving groups all across Canada. We're also seeing, like, industries that would have typically been not necessarily considered as a good fit for these types of services now coming on board. So I'll give you an example. We, we work with a large grocery chain with tens of thousands of employees a few years ago, like they would have never really considered virtual care. It would have been maybe too avant-garde. They're contending with a minimum wage hike in Ontario that makes paying for like these additional benefits. A sizable um, one. <laughs> yeah. So that's, it's, we're now at the point in, in the beginning of 2020 that like I'll make a broad generalization, but it's I think it's fair to say and most folks in this space would agree that like if you're an HR leader in Canada, like you've heard about virtual care and you've heard about it a bunch. Like you've either been you've received a cold call from like someone on, on our team, you've received a call from another vendor, a competitor of ours, your insurer has mentioned it, your advisor mm -hmm. consultant has mentioned it, your peer has mentioned it, you've read about it in the benefits Canada and industry pubs and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely less esoteric. So yeah. let's talk about the doctors. So where are you sourcing these doctors <laughs> and what's their experience like? Yeah. So for us, we focused on not only staffing our, our, our platform with doctors, but really building like a multidisciplinary team. And that team is comprised of obviously doctors, but RNs, so nurses, uh -huh. uh, nurse practitioners, care coordinators, allied health professionals, you know, mental health coaches in, in, in this wide range. And effectively what that does is that allows us to pair the right resource with the patient at the right time. So I think back to an exchange I had with our, our CMO, who's an ER doctor here in Montreal, a doctor, Julien Martel. And, you know, he says, you know, if, if a new mother were to come on the platform with a question, she was having trouble nursing. He's like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I'm a doctor. And everyone kind of like uh, thinks I'm uh, all high and mighty. But he's like, I'm probably not the best resource to help that person at that time. Yeah, Special for us. Yeah, it's really about specializing and, and, and putting the right resource with that right person at the right time. So we've got a, a large network. For us, most of our practitioners are full-time employees. And that's something that's really different compared to some of the other providers who are doing more. Let's so you're employing them directly? In many, many cases, yeah. So the mm -hmm. nurses, the nurse practitioners, like where we favor that 
for a number of reasons. It allows us to run a safer practice. It allows us to run a more compliant, control the experience. Like, you know, the same way that, you know, there's some on, on the other extreme, there's some providers that like try to just like tout a large network of doctors, but you know, it's sort of like, it's like an Uber experience where mm. if you have a bad Uber driver, you give one star, you move on. Like, whereas if you have a bad healthcare experience, like there's a lot more at stake and there's a lot less control. Well, um, it's interesting too, because if they're full-time employers for you, employees for you, then, I mean, the reality is, is that you have a vested interest in basically allocating those hours as efficiently as possible. So one of the big problems with any medical system anywhere around the world is that, okay, so you basically have a problem. You go to your doctor, which is more expensive than say the nurse who could triage that because they're the first point of contact and oftentimes, or go to the emergency room, which is the most expensive form of care. And the problem is, is that the, the access points tend to be the most expensive access points. Whereas you guys are able to take in the data of what's actually going in and okay, this is a problem. We can start you off here, right? And that could be with a nurse practitioner practitioner versus a doctor versus a specialist and something. And there's a different cost point to all these people, right? So yeah. if anything, I think you introduce efficiencies into the medical system that were not there before. hundred percent. And like a great example, you know, again, I'll, I'll, I'll say to my son, who's a five, five and a half now, as he would say, but uh, he's, um, you know, he's, he's got like recurring styes on his eye and I've consulted with nurses, like that's well within the scope of practice of a nurse. So for them to be able to, to provide advice and, and like a treatment plan, like it's cost effective and we're able to pass those those cost savings on to the, to the payer, which in our case is the employer, right? So mm-hmm. it's really about operational efficiency. So in Canada, like doctors by nature are like contractors. So, you know, we have obviously full-time doctors and in some cases, many of them are, are doing contract work with us, but it's also about providing like a really like structured, safe experience. So we don't have doctors taking consults like from their smartphone in their car. Like if you're... Working no, but because this is what's happening in, in, in a lot of virtual care experiences. Well, I can see that, and, right? If you're not controlling the experience, these people are going to log in to work whenever they want, right? And that could yeah. be them sitting in their cottage or unfortunately driving, unfortunately. But yeah, but, no, uh, but we've we've seen that, and 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 so like you know, when you consult, you're going to consult with a, and it sounds kind of cheesy, but it's interesting. You're going to consult with a physician that's wearing a white dialogue lab coat. Like some of the doctors laugh, like they're like, you know, I've never worn a lab coat in my in my practice in, in ten years, and the idea is that like virtual care is sort of a new paradigm, and and folks just like I they just trust it. Like you can have a hundred degrees on the wall behind you. They're going to trust the lab coat more than the degrees. Yeah. Um, totally. It's, I mean, like it's, it's, it's a symbol of like of healthcare. In, 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 in. Well, I think it works two ways, right? You have that, you know, you have the kind of, okay, this is the experience I'm used to just through a screen and little known fact they, uh, so for example, drone operators in the U S military specifically have to wear their air force uniforms when they're conducting them. And they don't want to create too much of a disconnect between what the traditional concept of the job is and the new reality of the job is. And I think in general, also, I think, if you just have doctors show up dressed in whatever t-shirt for whatever concert they were at last night, um, whatever it is, it takes away from it takes away from their professionalism as well, right? So that makes a lot of sense to me. So you mentioned you're also in Germany. Why was Germany the first non-domestic expansion you guys did? What was the appeal? Yeah. So for us, we've we've always been interested in international expansion. And so we had done, uh, and I, I won't get into too too much details, um, just for confidentiality reasons. But we were interested in in markets where we feel we can add value. So Germany was when we did our first analysis. Germany was one of the opportunities that that arose as being a, a market that we where we felt like we could do just that. Subsequently, in our Series A round, we we had uh, participation from a large venture fund in, in Germany, uh, Holzbrink Ventures. So they had participated, and what that also did was that allowed us to leverage like some of their network and bringing some of those projects to fruition. So. I'm pleased to say that as of today, we have sort of two projects ongoing in Germany. So we have um, a joint venture with the largest hospital group in Germany. Uh, it goes by the name of Helios, where they will be, they have a network of dozens of hospitals across Germany, and they're going to be using our technology to effectively digitize the experience for, for some of their patients. And that's uh, that's really interesting and exciting. And then uh, interesting timing for this podcast, as of this morning, we announced the acquisition of a group called Argumed, which is a German occupational health company. I don't want to get into too, too much, but effectively in Germany, the way that it works is that if you're a company over a certain size, I think it's something like 30 employees, like you have certain requirements that you need to meet in terms of the certain like occupational health services mm. that you make available to your employees. So that we've taken an existing business that has had great success in Germany and, and we're trying to bring a little bit more again, that digital 
a digitization to the experience that they're offering. So a lot of interesting things on the horizon for Germany. You know, we have a, a, a distinct team, like obviously focus is really, really important for dialogues. So we have distinct resources and team working on that project, but our top focus here at home is to really like the continue to drive the, the success that we've had working with large employers across, uh, across Canada. I did not see that announcement. You guys do a better job with these press releases. Yeah. Missed it entirely. I think unless, unless I jumped the gun an hour. Either way, you're, you're, <laughs> well, you're first. Even if you did, even if you did screw up in the disclosure, the reality is is that this is not airing for a couple of weeks. So exactly, no I problem. think we we're under embargo till nine thirty, so it's eleven. I think and, yeah, unless yeah, that shifted okay. a day, I don't know. I might have missed it by a day. Yeah, you heard it here first. So tell me about the consumer feedback. Because at the end of the day, it comes down to the end user, yeah. and we'll talk about both parties. So the consumers and the uh, employers. What is the feedback you're getting from both of them at this point? Yeah. So we monitor both really closely. So we measure obviously patient satisfaction, which is which is through the roof. We look at a, a metric called Net Promoter Score, mm-hmm. uh, which is basically you know if you've ever been surveyed, asked how likely are you to recommend a service on a scale of one to ten. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So our NPS is on par with you know the Teslas and Apples of the world, um, which that's, is that's which small. Is, no, mean? yeah. It's a so 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 for us that's that's something that we're we're proud of. In addition to that, we look at verbatim feedback. So it was interesting. Even even this morning, I was looking at a couple of comments, and I'll just uh, I'm just going to read them to you. And this is like we, yeah. we're doing a high volume of consults on a daily basis. But recently, some of the feedback that I read was quote Great service, saved me a lot of time, very efficient. The next quote was I was so impressed with your help. Not to mention the follow up that they did in the following days after the consult. And then the other one was, I love the application, how fast the doctors are, the response time, and how kind everyone is. I love this. Mm. And this is a group. They're a large consult, national consulting company. Mm. Satisfaction score, NPS of over 80. And patients, in this case, self-reported, saving on average 4.6 hours per episode. So again, you're a large consulting wow, company. 4.6 hours per episode. I mean, like, yeah. that's that's nuts. Like, yeah. that's- And that's not us saying we hypothesize. Like, we asked Jason. Yeah. Yeah. You just did it. And it's also like, Perception is reality in this case. Mm -hmm. So rather than us saying like, we've created a a case that suspects that, because we also did that in the past. Like we worked with a law firm here in Montreal where we said like, okay, we we looked at all the consults that their, their patients did. And we said, okay, it was a dermatology case in Quebec. So we anticipate that that probably saved two hours, three hours, whatever it was. And then we were able to do a time save study there. But then we're like, well, let's just ask the users themselves how much time they think they saved. So it's again, like that's, that's like goodwill being banked with the employer. So you're like, there's a lot of gratitude. And the other thing that's worth, worth noting here is this is like a plan that we make available to the employees but also to their family members. So yeah, so just, I mean, net promoter scores like that are, are just crazy, insanely good. Anyone who wants to look at how those things are done, by all means, uh, Google it. And frankly, something we should all be, as a business, anyone who's in business should be should checking for themselves, no matter how big or small. So the feedback's been positive, all's well. I'm gonna hit you up with my three questions before we wrap up as to what the, uh, the bigger concerns, the bigger challenges have been. So the first question is, if you had one wish for something you could change in your business or the industry as a whole, what would it be? Just one, huh? I would wish for unlimited wishes. Uh, that, was, that was what I used to think about as a kid when, when you think about you had three wishes. But, but jokes aside, um, one of the areas that we've focused a lot on as an organization is compliance, security, safety, playing like really well with regulators and all these things. And, and we found that not necessarily everyone is as aligned with this type of approach as we are. So we feel like they're... I wish that... Uh, all the providers in the virtual care space in Canada were operating with that same level of integrity. Fantastic. Because I think we run the risk of giving virtual care a bad name in Canada. So it's not that well. Well, and it's a bit of a land grab right now. This is still early days, right? So yeah. frankly, it's not entirely surprising that people would just rush in and do it as fast as possible. And yes, yeah, so, I mean, it's good on you for taking the, the, the high road and doing things as, as best as you can. So the second question is, what's been the biggest challenge in the company to where it is today? Finding practitioners that are aligned with our, our values, finding employees that are aligned with our values, finding just like good talent coast to coast. But then also like early on, it was like a big education play, you know, in 2017 and 2018, no one had really heard of this type of thing. So we had to be out there beating our drum, making sure that folks were like aware of the value that virtual care could bring. But like at the same time, we had to be mindful and respectful of the fact that like things take time and that, you know, there were many, many, many cases, particularly back then where employers we would approach would say like, this sounds amazing. Like, but like, I just heard about it for the first time five minutes ago. So mm-hmm. like, let's talk about it in a year. And like now those conversations are really like becoming fruitful 
in you know the 2019 and 2020 so it's been a really interesting trajectory with that comes like a lot of competition which i think is overall good because now as i mentioned earlier like all hr leaders give or take have heard of virtual care which i think is really 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 good for the industry and it's just about you know making sure that we're being really crisp and clear on like why we feel like in many cases we're the right partner for for these large employers to help yeah. deliver on the promises of virtual care that we talked about earlier like around talent attraction reduced absenteeism and so on yeah. i mean not and frankly there's a bit of a I won't say compounding effect, an interesting exponential growth factor, because I mean, as people change employers and, you know, move from a plan that has one that didn't have one and, you know, are audacious enough as to say, well, I would really like to have this. And, you know, this was great on my last employer. As HR managers move between companies to companies, the ones that have become your advocates, it's just it's a matter of time. You know, every time, every time there's a friction to one company and someone else goes to another, it's an opportunity for, for the likes of, of you guys with virtual care. So Absolutely. Um, it's a matter of time. So next question is what excites you the most about what it is you're working on and gets you up every day to keep fighting a good fight? Yeah. The thing I like the most is I've never worked for an organization or offering a product that I found to be so relatable. And and that's, that's nothing against any other company I've worked for. I've had great, great companies I've worked with in my career, selling great services, great products and all that. But, you know, for example, I spent about a decade with a company called Lightspeed. They're offering um, point of sale uh, systems for, you know, SMB retail and restaurants. And, 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 you know, I worked in retail and restaurants as as a teenager and things like that, but I was never like, I was never a a small business owner that, so I couldn't necessarily relate directly to what I was, what I was doing Mm -hmm. in dialogues case, you know, ultimately we're in the business of happy, healthy, productive people. So, you know, we deliver on that promise via virtual healthcare service focused on, you know, physical and mental health, but it's my mid thirties. I'm, I've got a young child, like I'm busy and I can just like, I can go into a meeting and I can speak really confidently and really credibly about what we're doing because like I am a user, right? Like, I don't know if you remember the hair club for men. Remember the hair club for men? <laughs> I'm not so glad I bought the company. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly, that's exactly it. So, so like, I'm glad, I'm glad you picked up on that, but it's like the guy used to say like, I'm not only the president, I'm also a client. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I really relate to that statement. I'm, I mean, I'm not the president, but the idea is that like, I get it. I'm really biased. I work for dialogue and all that, but but at the end of the day, like I often go into meetings and I show like these are real life cases that I've used uh, dialogue for. And ultimately, like that's what really kind of excites me day, day in and day out is that it's really something I enjoy talking about. Like it's not like we are a healthcare company first, but ultimately we're in the business of happy, healthy, productive people. We're not selling complex surgical devices. We're selling productivity and we're selling outcomes. And, and that's something that I think is really, really cool and really exciting. One thing I should have asked you earlier, and I usually don't have a question to that, but uh, I'll wrap it up. What's your favorite feature that you guys are using? Because, I mean, I've heard different opinions on different people's favorite features in these things. So I'm curious as to what yours is. The follow-up, like, holds a special, like, place in my heart. Like I told you earlier, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, that's something that, that I, it's, it's unique to what we do. Like, the follow-up and the navigation, like, I'm a, I'm a Torontonian living in Quebec. Like, I speak French, but it's not my native tongue. And sometimes, like, you know, navigating, like, some of the provincial health resources can be a challenge, like, as a native Anglophone. So just being able to go on and get, like, help. Yeah, of course, get access to medical care quickly. Like, cool. That's sort of, like, table stakes among virtual care from a high level. But being able to get some of those like complementary services included that like really facilitate that continuity of care, like mm-hmm. that's one thing that we really, really, really shine. And I think that like the follow up and the navigation, the concierge, and all the additional services around that are something that that I really, really, really like benefit from and really, really appreciate as a user. Great, excellent. We'll keep it up. Uh, for nothing. I mean, the NPS scores like what you're talking about. That's you're clearly doing fantastic work and it's been vetted. So uh, I wish you nothing but the best of luck and keep people healthy. Thanks a lot, Jason. Thanks for having me. So that was my interview with Zach Brown of Dialogue Health. Hope you enjoyed it. And I hope that all of us have access to this type of service going forward because, frankly, it just makes a lot of sense for all parties involved. And with that, as always, I'm Jason Pereira. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever it is you get your podcast. Until next time, take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at fintechimpact.co.